It's a rejuvenating feeling after tea or a coffee or a nutritious drink, I must say. And I will try my best to make this conversation really meaningful. I really have two best brains here. Uh, I mean, I don't need to give any introduction about NPCI or UPI or BMAP or something. Uh, not only in India, but even if you go abroad. I had gone to attend this event called Cybos last year. And uh, I met a couple of foreign bankers. Obviously, my agenda was to interview them. But whenever I met somebody from a foreign land, and when I told them that I'm from India, uh, work as a journalist, the first thing they asked me is, tell me something about UPI. Tell me something about Aadhaar. And I think that's how there is a major difference of UPI, Bheem, that made in this country. Uh, Ma'am, I would like to start from you, and if you could enlighten me on while building UPI, Bheem, and Bharat Bill Payment and everything, what goes behind NPCI to keep the India on a global map? Hi, thank you. So lovely to be here. I think what has gone behind NPCI is the first part. You know, NPCI has been a very agile startup. I think I would say it's one of the very good startups of um, India, driven by the Indian ecosystem. Uh, to come up with innovations like UPI. And it's really that agility that is at the core of what goes on behind NPCI. Um, now, as NPCI looks at what next, you know, we are also in the midst of what we are calling internally an NPCI 2.0. So this is really about getting ready for the next generation of growth, building scale, ensuring we have the right, you know, back end, you know, all those sort of fancy diagrams that Varun showed us some time back. You know, ensuring we're getting it right and, you know, we don't have, um, you know, legacy of what we did uh, seven years and eight years back holding us from what we need to do for the future. So getting ready for scale, getting ready for complexity, getting ready for innovation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we, we miss this point many a time, but really getting our people ready. So building our talent, ensuring that they have the exposure to the best of what's happening in the world and uh, developing people in order for us to really deliver the deliver to the potential mm -hmm. uh, that is offered up here. So that's really, I think, what's critical behind the scenes. OK. Uh, interesting. I will obviously try to drill you more and get some more insights uh, in my next questions. But before that, you know, if you could give me some insights, Varun. Uh, you know, the ma'am told me what goes behind, you know, specifically in PCI to build this powerful infrastructure. Tell me on the networking side, tell me on the infrastructure side, because my introduction to Cisco is uh, whichever office I goes to, to interview somebody, the boardroom is decorated with the Cisco equipments. So tell me something about what goes behind specifically to build this powerful infrastructure, which will actually make the payment seamless. Uh, that, I think that's a very good question. And maybe I'll just link this back to what I mentioned in my talk as well. I think technology is just one element of it. I think uh, building a culture of innovation inside companies is a very critical thing, right? So uh, I completely agree with uh, what uh, Praveen Ma'am just said. Uh, the, the, the innovation model is probably more critical. And the focus at delivering the right customer experience through whichever technology makes sense, right? So whether we talk about 5G or whether we talk about AI or we are talking about contact centers, or we are talking about the different software capabilities that are being built. Uh, having teams of people who understand how to innovate using software, when to use it, how to use it correctly, I think that's very, very critical for us to kind of move to this next stage. And that's where Cisco is trying to focus as well, beyond the stuff that you see when you walk into the boardrooms. If you actually look at the innovation engine of Cisco that brought those products to the boardroom, the, 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 whether you see IP phones or whether you see video systems or anything else from Cisco, including routers, we have to continue to innovate constantly to keep ahead of our competition. And, and what, uh, what that means for us is, again, uh, you know, an innovation mindset internally within the company and a paradigm that sustains that innovation cycle. Right. So, in fact, Varun gave me a hint, ma'am, to ask you another question on the competition. We have seen a tremendous competition specifically into the payment space in the last three to five years. Obviously, most of them are operating on Beam and UPI. But considering this competition now, 
where do you want to take NPCI to a next level? I mean, UPI 2.0 and so many things you're already talking about and the payment has already been evolved, starting from QR scan code to you and, you know, whether you can you wink and make your face, you know, a spout and make payment, something like that are the new technologies the world is working on. So where do you want to take NPCI ahead of all the competitions? So I think two jobs. Uh, the first thing is to ensure that the product and platform capability that has been built is really fully utilized. And, you know, there is still so much more that uh, the, a platform like UPI, a platform like uh, the Aadhaar payment system, the platform like Rupay can do, that is yet untapped. So I think really getting those messages out, taking those use cases, benefits, you know, enabling the ecosystem players, whether it's banks, fintechs, um, you know, non-bank financial players, enabling those use cases to really get created and make a difference in the market is certainly the first priority. Mm -hmm. And then getting ready for the next generation products. Mm -hmm. And I think there are still a number of uh, problems that have not yet been addressed, right? If you look at offline payments, today a lot of us talk about mobile payments, it's cool, it's fancy, but there are still, when, especially in the context of mm -hmm. financial inclusion, you know, um, how do we address uh, people who probably don't have uh, yet mm -hmm. data connectivity at the quality that is actually required? Right. Um, what about voice-based payments? You know, do we need to do anything more from a platform standpoint mm. to enable access to people who are not literate? Because when we talk financial education, I think um, literacy is a big problem that we have. Mm. Um, everyone understands, everyone is numerate, but not necessarily has the ability to, to, to go through sort of complex, uh, right. uh, you know, screens and so on. So I think these are some of the problems. As we identify these problems, we want to work with the ecosystem to see what we need to do from a, from a next generation standpoint. And across all of this yeah. is really creating the platform to enable people to innovate at the edges. Right. So API accelerators, giving easy access to, our, to the platform so that people can take advantage of whatever is available and, and continue to, to drive the innovation agenda. True. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, when I was talking to one of the CEO, CIO of a top bank, what he told me is that no matter how much innovation we do, no matter how much technology that we adopt, at the end of the day, what matters for us is the network. If network is poor, we cannot help it. And network is poor everywhere, you know. You have to make, talk to somebody for one minute and you keep trying for at least five, six minutes is the uh, network issue right now. Slightly different point that I raised, but how strong and what is the importance of network specifically behind the payment ecosystem, uh, Varun, tell me, and also add to it, tell me the challenges that you face specifically building such network or infrastructure while boosting the payment structure. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a good question. So networks are the foundation of pretty much every service that we consume, right? And payments are, is no different, uh, whether it's digital payments or even, uh, you know, cash payments, all of this has a gigantic network behind it. That, that network runs on a lot of different types of infrastructure. It could run on a fixed infrastructure, it could run on a wireless infrastructure, and everything in between. So ensuring that the infrastructure is robust, it's reliable, it's scalable, is table stakes. Hmm. And the challenge with maintaining network infrastructure is that the technology, as technologies evolve and as use cases evolve, the demands that those services make from the network infrastructure continue to change. And while you may have had a robust infrastructure five years ago, but based on the use cases now, that infrastructure has to be kept up to date. Yeah. And there have been a lot of uh, uh, technological advances within the network, and, and these days Cisco uh, talks a lot about software-defined networks. Uh, we live in a world which is software defined, whether it's networks or data centers or any physical infrastructure, uh, including cloud. All of these are software defined uh, infrastructure paradigms, and the network is no different. The, the challenge in a number of countries with service providers, with uh, institutions that provide that fundamental infrastructure, is managing technical debt. And right. we were just having this conversation outside. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, while, while having tea, is today when, when Cisco, and Cisco uh, works with a lot of different uh, infrastructure providers around the world, service providers, banks, financial institutions, uh, providers like MasterCard who are effectively the backbone provider for a lot of other services. 
And what we notice is that technical debt, by and large, continues to rise. And technical debt, the way we define this, is its infrastructure that is not fit for purpose. And today, the Cisco value associated with this is around 30%. And what we project is that at present rates of investment, while people are investing more and more money into infrastructure, technical debt is expected to rise to about 50 to 60%, which means in three years from now, infrastructure will be even more outdated than it is today, yeah. even though we are putting more money into it. So this is something that uh, you know, infrastructure providers of all types need to really watch out for. Uh, and this is effectively something that Cisco helps with as well. Right, quite interesting for IT companies. Ma'am, tell me something now specifically about the future perspective and the kind of level that the NPCI wants to achieve on a global map. So we have seen obviously Visa and MasterCard everywhere in the world and now Rupee is actually somehow following that map. We can say that Rupee has been launched in few countries. Uh, going ahead, you know, how do you want to put NPCI on a global map? Are you prepared for that? What are the things that you are doing? And also adding to that, since many fintech companies I have partnered with you, they're offering these payment services. What is the scope for them to go global? Or what is the requirement? I mean, is there a demand specifically for these payment fintech companies globally? The second part is really very interesting. You know, I'll take that and then I'll go to the first part of your question. Because I think as organizations um, start up, grow, um, succeed in the home ground, you know, that's where they hone their skills, they, they sort of sharpen their business. They learn, win, lose, go through success, failure, etc. And that then creates the confidence in terms of how you take these propositions to other markets. So I think we are in a good space where uh, products like UPI and Rupee have done well in the domestic market, in the home ground, and I think they are now ready and the, the organization has the confidence, I think the country has the confidence, that we can take some of these uh, to other markets as well. Of course, we'll start from you know, basically following the needs of the Indian consumers, Indian users, the experiences they want when they travel abroad, and then it'll, it could move into other opportunities as well. And I think the same holds good for, uh, for any startup uh, in India, any fintech in India, and we have a number of very successful fintechs. The kind of innovations we've seen in India, I think, are, uh, are just mind-blowing, and the entire uh, success of platforms like this has been because of how hungry and eager people have been to take these, this infrastructure and then create the last mile uh, innovation, whether it is apps or whether it is providing a Aadhaar-enabled uh, payment service uh, in a small village. I think the entire gamut of innovation we are seeing here. And to take these into relevant markets um, and travel the journey together, I think it's an opportunity that will open up to every single uh, uh, fintech in the ecosystem here. But our uh, I mean, what could be the challenges? Because the other countries work in a different dynamics altogether. I mean, if you go to, I mean, Europe and most of the developed countries are still using and those countries are dominated by the cards. The card payments are still dominate or, dominated over there. Now the QR scan code is one area where most of the countries are working. However, in India, there is a lot of innovation. OTP messages and so many other things people are trying. And also the dynamics of the language in China, most of these applications are in their own languages and not in English. Do you still feel that, you know, we'll, we'll have a brighter future there? So innovation and opportunity works best when there are problems to solve. So if you move into markets and spaces where everything's hunky-dory, everything works well, it's all, you know, clean and neat, there's, you know, no problem to solve, then the opportunity is quite limited. I think the... The trick is to identify spaces, you know, whether it's geographies, countries, segments, customers, products, where there are problems to solve. And there will certainly be winners who will come out of that. Okay, so Indian FinTech should offer Japanese and Chinese solutions in Chinese language as well. I think that would be a, another area because, in fact, we are also adopting here NLP. Uh, most of the FinTechs are doing that. Varun, very important, and perhaps a last question, the time is running out. Since you said that, you know, the technology is getting updated, outdated, the lifetime of any technology is not more than two to three years. I mean, how should FinTech or payment companies bat on a technology then? Or how should I, as a customer, should believe in certain technology because I do not know whether this will work after two to three years. And as a company, how do you, you know, take calls or decide because the sustainability of technology is, is, is not there? No, I think it's a, this is not an easy problem to solve. But actually, before I answer this, I just wanted to say that 
Indian fintechs are already beginning to solve problems overseas. We have a couple of Indian fintechs operating in Japan, uh, delivering digital payments to a market that is effectively cash-based, right? So it's, it's happening. Um, on, the, on the question of technology obsolescence, look, this is, a, this is something that we just can't uh, get out of. This is something that requires uh, constant nurture and feeding because it has become the very foundation of our lives, right? But what I would say is that I think we need to focus a little bit less on the hype around disruptive technology and more around how that technology solves the problem for us. So that avoids a lot of unnecessary investment in technology. So for example, right now, you know, uh, you know people are familiar with the technology hype curve. Um, several technologies that you know, get spoken about, uh, they're effectively, there's no real problem to solve, but you know, these technologies are available. And if you are not aware of what use case, what, what problem they solve, you may invest in it and not get a return. So the critical, the critical uh, thing that I think all of us have to do is to ensure that we understand how this technology is going to solve either a problem of experience or some other use case that we have then at least we are sure that we are investing in, in it not for its own sake, but for the sake of a problem we have, right? And I think that's probably the best we can do. Technology ha will continue to evolve and we have to continue to sort of stay ahead of it, but at least we can stop investing in wasteful technology. So you finished exactly on the time. You wanna add something? Yeah, you know, since we're in, the, yeah. in, in a financial inclusion forum and you spoke about the go global question, there are a number of markets where the uh, very similar, you know, challenges that India faces are already present, you know. Uh, it could be African markets, it could be uh, certain Southeast Asian or uh, Middle East Asian markets, it could be Eastern European markets. So a number of markets where many of the problems we are seeing today and hence the solutions that, you know, will succeed will actually be quite portable into many of those markets. So I think those opportunities will certainly be there for people who, who successfully solve the problems for India. Great. Thank you so much for those uh, insights, ma'am, and thank you so much, Varun, for sharing those meaningful uh, insights. I'm so sorry we cannot take more questions. I mean, uh, there is no scope for me to take questions because we are already running uh, short of time. Thank you so much for listening to us patiently, and thank you so much for joining us.